Good morning. Um, uh, uh, Hattie makes me sound funnier than I am. Um, but the fellow coming up after me is with Microsoft. So if you would boo him for me, I'd be really grateful. <laughs> and I warned him that I was going to set him up. So you are welcome to boo him. Um, they're paying me so much money to be here today that I have to give you my uh, impression ad. You know, you go to a website, you pay by watching impressions. Uh, it's, it's about Lulu. So if you are a developer or if you are an entrepreneur and you want some way of better serving your customers with books that your customers will pay you for, and that's what I'll speak to right now, you go to lulu.com, you use our APIs at developer.lulu. There's your commercial introduction. So, so I was asked to come over and talk about how you make money in open source software. Uh, and of course, uh, th that is the mystery. And everyone who does it, does it a different way. But thanks to the success of Red Hat, people are under this, this uh, the false impression that I actually have the answer to that question. <laughs> and I hate to break it to you, I don't. Uh, because it will, uh, this is actually true for most of your businesses. Almost all businesses are successful in a different way. There is no magic bullet. Uh, it is where all those adages that you learned as a kid, the early bird actually does get the worm, a, a penny saved actually is a penny earned. All of these are true, and so pay attention to the simple ones. Don't worry about what your VCs are telling you or your, your business schools about market segmentation and channels to market. Just do the little things well. So I, I was going to talk about two things. One is money, uh, because there's a lot. To, uh, hold on. How many VCs are here? How many of you guys are VCs or work for VCs or aspire to be VCs? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm one of the few guys who you'll, that will be, get up here who will give the bankers a hard time because everyone is way too nice to bankers. But the reason I'm convinced we are way too nice to bankers in all their terms uh, is as entrepreneurs, it causes us to lose sight of what actually you are trying to do, which is you're not trying to get money from venture capitalists or from bankers. You're trying to get money from your customers. Customer money trumps all other kinds of money. It trumps um, mortgaging your house. It trumps hitting up on your parents for money. Uh, so, and that's the one sort of concern I had walking around. And by the way, I'm very impressed with this show and and uh, a little intimidated by the, how many smart people are here um, because I'm, for the record, not one of the smart people. Uh, I'm an old typewriter salesman. You know how all of us think of ourselves as our first job. So you're a software programmer who becomes a CEO or you're an accountant who becomes a CEO. I am a typewriter salesman who became a CEO. <laughs> And if you think that's a goofy description and you really wonder how does a typewriter salesman sort of help reinvent the software industry, m as much of a mystery to me as it is to you, so I don't know. Okay, but talking about customers for a second, uh, so it's customers and money are the only two things I actually care about, but I see them as the same thing. And my only concern with this show is we have a lot of people talking, saying incredibly smart things about technology, about uh, channels to market. Very few people, every good business here knows this phenomenon, that it's actually about your customer. If you build a customer-focused organization, everything else takes care of itself. So you know how you hear about culture and how important it is to have a team-oriented, collaborative, empowered culture. If you have a customer-focused culture, all of that takes care of itself because now your team is unified around making your customer successful. 
it's not about the team. It's not about the CEO. It's not about the vision. It's about the customer. And we've, we as a society have, have largely forgotten that it's about the customer and it's about being able to sell. Sales 101, being a salesman, a typewriter salesman. I don't know how many of you know uh, uh, the American author uh, Arthur Miller, but I have a particular hate on Arthur Miller. I never met the guy, so, so that's a little unfair, but he wrote the, the play Death of a Salesman. And in his play, he made his protagonist, Willie Loman, a plaid-suited, um, uh, I don't know, a very sad human being, a, an empty, vacant guy who tricked customers into buying things his whole life. And the whole play is about how terrible it is to be a salesman. He destroyed the profession that I am in for, like, Two generations, it's still a problem because no one's willing to call themselves a salesman. We are account representatives. We are customer empowerment people. No, we aren't, we're salesmen. Our job is to convince our customer that our product is going to solve their problem for them. That's what we do. And that's where you start building a customer-oriented operation. It's not about your technology, it's about whether the customer likes your technology. Because if he likes your technology, he will give you money for your technology. And if she gives you money for your technology, you don't have to be nice to the venture capitalists. <laughs> and that was the secret at Red Hat. So I'll, I'll tell you one story and then we'll, uh, we'll take a couple of questions. Um, uh, so the story at Red Hat was, uh, I stumbled into this open source thing. There's a long version of this, but I stumbled into it in about 1992. And when I first saw free software and open source software, I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever seen. Because I'm a free market capitalist. That is who I am. That's who my parents were. It's who my grandparents were. So some families produce doctors, my family produced entrepreneurial businessmen, going back multiple generations. Uh, you know, where doctors talk about with, with great sort of sadness the patients they lost, trying to think about how they might improve their, bus their, their uh, service to their customer. Around our dinner table, we talked about our business projects that crashed and burned to try and teach each other how not to run, <laughs> how not to make that mistake again. Okay, so I'm now looking at open source or free software. I'm talking to the engineers. The engineers are um, talking about, uh, yeah, free software and how the software was from engineer according to their ability to engineers according to their need. And if you haven't read Karl Marx, uh, or if you have, that'll sound familiar. 1992, the Berlin Wall had just fallen. Not, <laughs> it, it, I wasn't a big fan of, of human projects that don't have some sort of economic support to them. So a couple of years later now, we're 19, well, a year later, 93, instead of going away or getting weaker, this open source software, the, the Linux operating system, kept getting better. I just couldn't figure it out. Uh, it was, um, it just made no sense. So I actually took the time and went up and visited Richard Stallman in Boston and down to visit a fellow called Don Becker at Goddard Space Flight Laboratory. And I would ask them where this is from and they would give me similar versions until I met Don's boss at Goddard Space Flight Laboratory. Because Don was writing ethernet drivers for the Linux operating system and it turns out he was writing them during the day at Goddard Space Flight Laboratory. So I'm going, Don, someone's paying you to write this software. You're not doing this out of the goodness of your heart. Don goes, yes, I am. And I go, well, who's paying your salary because they should fire you if that's true? So uh, Don says, well, I don't really know why he lets me do it. You know, that my boss is Thomas Sterling. So we met 
Thomas Sterling in the basement of the Gardner, Goddard Space Flight Laboratory at 10 o'clock at night, like an empty cafeteria. I ask him this question. He says, so let me get this straight. Yes, we give away Ethernet drivers. They are quite valuable pieces of technology that we might be able to sell. And you're telling me you're taking advantage of me, but let's think about this. All I get in return of allowing Don to give away these, these sophisticated Ethernet drivers, all I get in return is a gigabyte worth of multitasking, multi-user operating system software with complete source code and a license to put it on as many machines as I can, as I can put my hands on, and you're taking advantage of me? And what he just finished articulating was a barter scheme. And a barter economy is a perfectly legitimate economic model, and as it turns out, has been a brilliant economic model, to the point where my colleagues here at Red Hat are still making a ton of money working collaboratively with engineers across the internet, giving away their software in order to be able to get software of greater or equal value. It, it's how our society works. And when you realize that, when, when you realize that all open source software was, uh, was how we actually work, our legal system. You may, you're a lawyer, you make a case in front of the Supreme Court, brand new argument, no one's ever heard it before. The very next lawyer standing up in the front of the same Supreme Court can use your argument without so much as asking your permission. That's all open source software is. It's a collaborative effort and you build business models the way the world normally builds business models, by looking after your customer. And Red Hat has done a brilliant job of that and, and are doing billions of dollars worth of revenue to customers who don't actually have to buy anything from Red Hat. They can use the Red Hat operating system for free. I still can't figure that one out. <laughs> It's one of the most valuable software companies on the planet, and yet you don't actually have to buy anything from them. But what you do is you want to buy things from them. You, as a, a, a major global corporation, you need the support. You have to know that your Linux that's running on your servers in Malaysia is the same Linux that's running on your server in Copenhagen if you want these machines to work properly together that's Red Hat's business model. Although I'm not allowed to wear my Red Hat because I don't work for them anymore and they'll probably be in denial of that whole story. Okay, a couple of questions here. How can we become better salesmen? It's really easy. Spend more time with your customers. And if they hate your product, quit trying to sell them a product they hate. <laughs> this is my trick. I'm, I'm both a sales guy and one of the laziest human beings you'll ever meet. <laughs> so, so, so I don't like selling products that my customers don't want to buy because that's hard work. I would much rather sell my customers things my customers want to buy because that's easy. <laughs> And I like easy stuff. But the more time you spend with your customers, the better a salesman you will be. Simple as that. Uh, implement a, a user. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's not about your users. Users are lovely people. It's about your customers. The difference between user and customer? Customers give you money. <laughs> money is important. <laughs> so I love my users. Uh, at lulu.com, we have several million users. We have several hundred thousand customers. We love our users. We truly are married to our customers. Uh, my definition of success. How much, who, who's keeping time here? Do we know how much time I have? Sorry? Okay. Uh, my definition of success. Okay, you have to do two things well. Uh, one is, you have to choose your spouse well. I was incredibly fortunate that. So I'm married to my wife, Nancy. We have three little kids in, in elementary school. 
I lose my job. I had built a computer leasing business. Uh, we had sold that business to a bigger financial services company. That company then went bankrupt, taking our life savings with them. So now I'm working out of Nets sewing closet. And, and Nets, he says, so what are you going to do for a job? And I'm, gonna, I'm saying, I think we're going to sell free software. <laughs> you know your wife loves you when she doesn't take the kids and move back with her mother. <laughs> and she didn't. So the other one is choose your parents well. That's probably the most important one. If you chose your parents well, you are blessed with innate skills and, and innate wisdom. And the trick on that one, by the way, is it's not actually about choosing your parents because we all chose brilliant parents. It's about leveraging them. They, they're not your problem. Like, I, I can tell you when I was a kid just how evil my parents were to me. And I could still walk around with a chip on my shoulder because my mother yelled at me for not doing my homework. Uh, no, 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 no. Once you're an adult, even a young adult, your parents are your best friends. So just treat them that way. You'll find they'll be much better parents if you do. Okay. So, and then finally, but stemming out of both of those, all this money stuff, I, I, we took Red Hat public. A great pleasure. I'm still, I get to do fun things because of the, the, uh, the capital the, the, that generated, but, but that wasn't the point. I don't get to take my Red Hat shares or even my cash that I got for Red Hat shares with me when I go to the pearly gates. I do get to take my relationship with my wife and my kids and my grandkids and my parents with me. So don't ever lose sight of that. Don't shortchange your personal relationships for your business. And that's a tough thing to do because if you're launching a business, it's ridiculously hard. It's ridiculously long hours. But you're all smart people. And, and the, um, uh, the, the F. Scott Fitzgerald, the, another American author, uh, had a great line goes, the sign of a first-class intelligence is the ability to keep two opposing thoughts in mind at the same time and retain the ability to function. So here's your two opposing thoughts. One is, if you're launching your business, you're going to have to work stupidly long hours. You're going to have to do it to make your customers successful because only by making your customers successful do you make your business successful. And you have to make your family and your loved ones the center of your life. <laughs> Those are two opposing concepts. You got to do them both. You don't have a choice. So just make sure you do that. So the, anything else? The definition of success. How does a sales background help become CEO of a tech company? It actually doesn't. Uh, like no one in the tech industry was ever going to hire a typewriter salesman. Like, no one. So what you have to do is you have to start your own tech company. <laughs> then what you do is you go and you print uh, business cards that say, Bob Young President. And you don't give those cards to your customers because you don't have any. <laughs> you give those customers to your mother. And then she quits worrying about her idiot youngest son because clearly he's president of his own company. But that is how I got a job in technology. I did not apply for a job. I was a terrible student. No one would have offered me a job. So in my world, the low risk thing, everyone thinks starting companies is high risk. In my world, starting a company was low risk because no one was going to hire me. <laughs> so there you go. Well, thank you very much. Sam, are we done here? Thank you very much and have a great show.